Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Anne Glover, and I'm the chair of the Post-COVID Futures Commission uh, and past president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So let me give you a very, very brief background about the RSE, the Royal Society of Edinburgh. It's Scotland's National Academy. Uh, we have some 1,600 or so fellows who are elected on the basis of their excellence of contribution uh, to society in Scotland and beyond. And interestingly for a national academy, they come from a very broad range of areas. So arts, humanities, sciences, but also from public life, from business, from the creative industries and so on. So a very broad range of expertise, which we can rely upon. We were founded in 1783, but our strapline, our, our purpose is knowledge made useful. And so that excellence of our fellows uh, is brought to bear for the benefit uh, of Scotland. Now, today's event is about uh, having a, a global conversation about COVID, how COVID has been communicated. And uh, one of the reasons that we're hosting this event is because the Royal Society of Edinburgh um, launched a post-COVID Futures Commission last year, uh, bringing together commissioners who are fellows and, and others who have been co-opted in order to see how Scotland can come out of the pandemic in a way better than it went into it. So what can we learn and what can we do in the future? And this post-COVID Futures Commission, we decided just to identify four areas that we were going to work on. And it, four areas because we wanted to avoid overlap where others were looking at additional issues. And the four areas that we chose were looking at national resilience. We looked at uh, data, science and evidence. We looked at uh, public services or inclusive public services. And the last area, public debate and participation. And really that's uh, the main part of this particular event today and your opportunity to take part in that debate. And so what I would like to do is I'd like to hand over uh, to one of our commissioners who led on the public debate and participation uh, Talat Yacoub. Talat is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She previously was the chief executive of Equate, and she's now an independent consultant and researcher, also a campaigner and, and writer, and someone who is particularly interested in equality for uh, women and race. So Talat, can I hand over to you to tell us about this part of the commission? Thank you very much, Anne. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, as has been said, my name is Talit Yacoub and I'm uh, the co-chair of the working group as part of the Post-COVID-19 Futures Commission of the RSE. We're focusing on public debate and participation. In this working group, we are trying to examine the extent to which the public in Scotland has been um, equal partners in the decisions that have been made around COVID-19, how we have responded uh, and whether we have responded adequately, particularly for those who are furthest away from access to opportunity, power and wealth. Part of the uh, working group is also looking at public debate. That includes misinformation or disinformation. It includes how we have talked amongst ourselves and the general public about COVID-19 and how we have engaged in or failed to engage in public health messaging. Has it worked for us and to what extent? We're looking to build upon what we have done already in Scotland. We're looking to identify what has happened well, what could have been improved to make ourselves better ready for any future crisis. Part of the work that we are discussing today as um, part of this international research we have done is focused on that public debate and participation and what we can learn beyond Scotland, beyond the UK from nations who have also been going through the same crisis because this has been a global crisis, a global pandemic and it's important for us to learn from others and have solidarity to prepare ourselves better um, as, a, as a united world in any crisis we see in the future. We held closed roundtables in April 2021 with international experts, which focused on the theme of how have we communicated with citizens and involved them in the country's pandemic response. 
alongside the Round Table, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and commissioned the Democratic Society to carry out an international review, exploring approaches taken by different countries to COVID-19. We wanted to find out how they communicated and how they engaged the public. The report has been launched today and is on the Royal Society of Edinburgh's website. A rapporteur report from the round table will also be available to read on the RSE website and uh, Ruth Lightbody, who's part of the discussions today, will be discussing more of that. All of this was um, delivered in hectic times um, and it shouldn't be seen as a catch-all for everything that's happened um, across the world and um, COVID-19. Much of, of what we are learning is still to be produced, data is still to be gathered, but we have a good um, idea, a good review of what has been happening across the world and what we can learn from. So to find out more about this, I'm going to pass over now to Alexa Wood from the Demo Democratic Society, who will provide an overview of the international review they carried out and the report they have produced. And um, please remember to think of questions that you can ask um, and engage in discussion um, after she has done. I'll pass over to Alexa now. Thank you, Talit. I think we're actually going to be watching a video that goes alongside the report launch before I speak. Democratic Society was commissioned by the Royal Society of Edinburgh to conduct a rapid review, exploring international approaches to communication and participation during the COVID pandemic. As case studies, we looked at Belgium, Brazil, Finland, Canada, Ghana, New Zealand, South Africa and Taiwan. It turns out that communication was used to drive participation, but participation was largely understood to mean compliance with national efforts. Science-based communication, or informing, educating, and raising awareness on science-related topics, was mainly carried out by public health officials to convey the seriousness of the pandemic. Science communication was also used to justify lockdown measures and encourage the public to follow the rules and regulations. There was a lot of information broadcast to the public from official sources, but citizen participation in helping design the crisis response and being part of decision making was uncommon. This basically means there was a lack of conversations, dialogue and collaborative decision making. But when we did see it, it was thanks to the use of tried and tested networks such as community health workers in Brazil and South Africa. Social media influencers in Finland, or the Maori community rallying together to organise a tailored response in New Zealand. What also came through the research was that pandemic responses cannot rely solely on the expertise of public health officials. But need to include citizens. This will help create a more human strategy that factors in everyday lived experience including elements of creativity and humour. This can be done through democratic dialogue and debate, not enough of which took place during the pandemic. So, to make rapid, collective decisions in times of crisis, it is crucial to invest in equitable, collaborative and participatory decision-making structures, both beforehand and continuously. The Royal Society of Edinburgh will use these learnings to stimulate improvement in public debate and participation. So I've been working on the report, which is launching alongside today's uh, event um, since February. Along with the report, we created a video that you just watched, which my uh, colleague Annie Cook was behind. Thanks, Annie. I'm going to spend the next slide five minutes expanding on the research that was woven into the video. I'm going to spend the next five minutes expanding on the research summary that was woven into the video on how and why we conducted the research and highlight a couple of examples. This is a teaser, which will hopefully pique your interest and then you can get all the details from the full version of the report. This report is firstly a rapid review focusing on the international approaches to science communication and engagement, specifically COVID-19 communication and engagement. I'm not a science communicator, insofar as it's not a professional title that I can wear on my name tag. I am a deliberative democracy practitioner and a researcher interested in the interface between science, most often climate in my case, and politics. Part of my job with the Democratic Society, a networked organization working across Europe to strengthen democracy, is to create spaces for communicating science. Ideally, these spaces are spaces where thorough, nuanced discussions amongst members of the public 
are tethered to scientific evidence and decision-making power, i.e. democratic spaces. There are, of course, questions about what democracy looks like in a crisis, where the utterance of emergency shifts us away from democratic debate into an arena of unilateral and decisive leadership. What does this mean in an extended crisis, an emergency with fatigue, one where the guise of science being able to tell us what to do disintegrates over time? These are all questions that were raised by the literature we reviewed and the interviews we conducted as part of this research. We collected much of the data through desk, desk research, working through journal articles, reports, government websites, and articles from established media outlets. Given the emergent nature of the topic, data was supplemented, where possible, by interviews with academics, practitioners, and other experts already a part of democratic societies and RSE's network. These were semi-structured interviews and were video calls, so I suppose they were also desk research to some extent. We interviewed 13 public health communication and participation experts. We also considered the discussions that were held at the two international roundtables that Talat mentioned. In this review, we were interested in approaches to communication and participation in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, with particular attention to innovative practices related to public health messaging and engagement, such as combating misinformation and disinformation, addressing structural inequalities, and the implications for dem democracy and the social contract. We were looking at eight case studies, Belgium, Brazil, Canada, Finland, Ghana, New Zealand, South Africa, and Taiwan. So, with this in mind, I'm going to spend the next two minutes expanding on one of the findings that was raised in the video, that finding being the implied relationship between science communication and participation that came through in our interviews and workshops. And then I'm going to very briefly give two examples. When we embarked on this project, we were thinking about participation in terms of decision-making structures and governance, in terms of helping design the crisis response. Instead of broadcasting information outward to the public sphere, we had our eyes open for a back and forth dialogue around public policy responses to COVID-19. However, we wanted to learn how communication and participation were understood in each of the national contexts. So we left it open to interpretation. As it turns out, participation was not understood as shaping those rules and regulations, but instead as equating to compliance with the rules and regulations, participation in the national effort, the focus on science communication was to demonstrate the severity of the crisis, allowing people to understand and therefore comply with the rules in space in place. It was often based on an information deficit model of communication with serious limits, many of which were highlighted by our interview participants. Um, of course, this was not across the board. I don't have much time, but I want to quickly highlight two examples that made use of tried and tested networks and some back and forth dialogue. In Canada, there were some existing programs, the Digital Citizens Initiative and a federal government or federal campaigns that were tied to the 2019 federal election that were already operating in the country to combat disinformation. The Digital Citizen Initiative was an existing program focused on combating anti-scientific sentiments and its original focus was on climate change. Because of the timing of when the previous Canadian federal government election fell right before the pandemic, there were several information and ad campaigns connected to uh, debunking fake news. When the pandemic hit, the Canadian government added additional funding into these programs and encouraged them to switch gears and focus on combating disinformation in the COVID-19 pandemic. In Brazil, I, we heard of an interesting initiative in a municipality where community health workers who were going through their neighborhoods collected fake news circulating um, through the week and submitted it to the local health authority. With this information that was coming in through existing networks and inputs, um, the health authority processed it and got together some answers so that the mayor could go around in a vehicle and drive through the municipality one day a week and start sharing why uh, people should be listening to this information as opposed to that information and having a bit of a back and forth dialogue. So there was input and uh, use of existing tried and tested networks for that. 
I'll leave you with this final thought. Uh, this research identified opportunities for creating a space for dialogue and debate in the midst of the pandemic. It highlights the importance of investment in advance of crises in equitable, collaborative and participatory decision-making structures so that these opportunities can be seized upon. At a panel a few months ago uh, that I was also on, science journalist Philip Ball ended his talk by saying that COVID-19 has taken the lid off of silent science, revealing what it is and what it isn't, what it can do, what it cannot do. At Democratic Society in the Royal Society of Edinburgh, we were asking what public dialogue and governance structures can exist in that space that's been revealed. Answers to that question are peppered throughout the pages of the review, so I hope that you can take a look. Thank you. Uh, Alexa, thank you very much for that. And uh, for those of us who are joining, just to remind you that you can see that whole report on the RSE website if you would like to see more of the detail. So first of all, what I would like to do then is to introduce our panel. And so um, we're going to have a discussion around communication of COVID and how that happened differently in different places. So this is an international event. And I'm very pleased to welcome, first of all, Courtney Addison. So Courtney is um, a lecturer from the Center for Society, Science and Society at Te Herenga Waka, which is the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. Um, so it's late in the evening for Courtney. So Courtney, thank you for joining us. And you could turn your video on now, please, if that's possible. Um, so welcome to Courtney. Um, secondly, I'd like to um, welcome Dr. Kai Maud Hanafia. And Kai is Senior Research Officer um, uh, currently seconded to the Burnett Institute in Melbourne in Australia, um, but also senior lecturer at the University Sens in Malaysia. So we've got two birds for one stone here. We've got a perspective from Malaysia and Australia. So New Zealand, Malaysia and Australia so far. And then I'd like to welcome Dr. Ruth Lightbody, uh, who's a lecturer in politics at Glasgow Caledonian University. Um, in the Department of Social Sciences. Um, Ruth's research focuses on deliberative democracy and public participation, so uh, absolutely central to our discussion today. And um, she's been involved in projects around Scotland, including those involving citizens' juries, where citizens uh, discuss events such as, for example, looking at wind power. And uh, more recently, I think, Ruth, you've also looked at uh, how, how well the role of experts in giving uh, evidence for deliberative processes. So uh, we have Scotland on our panel as well. And then finally, uh, a warm welcome to Professor uh, John Giapong, who's Vice Chancellor uh, at the University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ghana. John's background is having trained uh, in, in medicine as a doctor, uh, but also has done an MSc at the School of um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, particularly looking around uh, infectious diseases and epidemiology. So again, uh, absolutely uh, crucial for our thinking around response to COVID. So those are our expert panelists. And what I would like to do is just to uh, ask you one or two uh, questions in particular. Um, so what I would ask all of you to think about is, what would you say that you think that your own nations have done particularly well in the narrative and communication around COVID um, and what might have been done better. And um, actually, Courtney, I, I'm going to come to you first and, and ask you what you think uh, New Zealand has done well. And I'm particularly mindful of um, almost the global example that people hold New Zealand up for in saying how well it's done, but that might not be absolutely everybody's feeling in New Zealand. It's just what we hear elsewhere. So Courtney, what do you think you've done well or not so well? 
Yeah, thank you so much, Anne. Um, you're right, it's not everybody's opinion in New Zealand, but there is certainly um, wide admiration for the way that government have handled communications, but also our COVID response here. Um, I think you can sort of break this down into three aspects. One is the format, one is the people involved, and one is the actual content of their communications. So in terms of format, um, New Zealand implemented a um, what ended up being a sort of four week um, level four lockdown. It's one of the most extreme lockdowns in the world, um, but it did achieve an elimination strategy for COVID. Um, and during that period, we had these daily briefings where our prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, and the director general of health would present live on television, the daily case numbers, how we were doing, other relevant updates. Um, it was punctual, it was a very reliable cast of characters that people were seeing, and that format really um, became routine for people as we went through this really extreme national event. Um, so the format was critical. The characters were also important. Um, people describe our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern as seeming like a human being, which seems like something you shouldn't have to point out, but I think it's not necessarily the norm. Um, she engaged very empathetically with people and she also engaged with some of the scientific evidence. So we have photos of her sort of holding graphs up showing, um, you know, some of the data that they're actually basing their political decision making on. And similarly, our Director General of Health was seen as someone who was really on top of the facts. Um, he always had papers in front of him, which is something that the people we interviewed talked about as a sign for why they trusted him, like he had his material there. Um, and he too was seen as a sort of genuine, honest, transparent human being. And then that content as well, the actual stuff that they were talking about, right? Um, it was always justified. They explained the decisions that they were making and people felt that um, what they had to do as citizens as part of a national COVID response was clear. And that was outlined in documentation, but it was also reiterated really usefully through those daily briefings. Okay, so so one of the things that you uh, you mentioned there was um, it's about participation, and I noticed that your prime minister Jacinda Ardern talked about the team of five million, so that mm. it was everyone was involved. Was that important? It was really important. Um, so I've got colleagues Rebecca Priestley and Alex Beatty who are actually like um, analysing the sort of content of those communications and. The team of 5 million worked really well as a slogan because New Zealand is a country with a rich sporting history. We all know what it's like to be part of a team. Sports itself has a moral valence, right? It enjoins us to behave in a particular way for our teammates. So it really pulled people together as part of this collective enterprise that had a very clear goal. And there were rules to the game, like everybody knows how sports works. Um, so that metaphor was really effective and it did People, we're interviewing people ongoingly and people speak about feeling a part of that community and feeling like they wanted to chip in for other people. Um, that slogan also came under fire when a lot of expat New Zealanders had a hard time getting back in the country over the course of the last 18 months. Um, but that's perhaps something we can pick up later if people are interested. Okay, thanks. Could I pick up with you, Ruth, uh, on that? Because a lot of what Courtney's described uh, with... Um, a trusted cast of characters or a reliable, uh, you know, in that we knew who was going to turn up at the daily briefing was something that we saw in Scotland uh, compared to the rest of the UK. Do you think that the, the reaction was the same as the one that Courtney has just described in, in that, you know, it was uh, very well received by the population in New Zealand? What about Scotland? Thanks, and I think that's a really good point to make. I think there are similarities in that there was this the clear daily briefings. We'd expect Nicola Sturgeon and we'd expect uh, Jason Leach to appear on our TVs and set out uh, what had been happening. And at the beginning of that pandemic, that was really important, that consistency of message, um, that idea that we all have a responsibility. There's a social contract between the public to each other um, in order to abide by these restrictions. Um, and that sort of was slightly different from what was coming out of Westminster in the UK, which they took a more sort of paternal um, look at it, where um, not necessarily all the time, but there was um, times where certain groups were blamed for an increase in um, numbers. I don't think um, there could ever be the same, the same response from the public because we did have high, high rates of um, COVID and we had high death rates as well. And 
the public um, perceived that we had um, responded quite late to lockdown. We locked down quite late. And then there was also these cases of um, maybe our scientific experts and some of our MPs not sticking to the restrictions themselves. So where you talk about trust, a lot of that trust got lost along the way where people felt that they were maybe abiding by the rules and the experts or the elites maybe weren't. And therefore they were feeling let down. What uh, Scotland did do well in some respects is that um, they did try and hear from local people as well. So it wasn't just a one way um, process of communicating at the public, we wanted to hear back from them as well. So they've had a citizens panel on COVID at the beginning of the year. There was consultation to the government website and there was a public conversation on uh, coronavirus about the, the decision-making framework. All of these things, we have to think about how far reaching that was, who was actually getting involved with that? And was that everyday people that were really struggling um, at the forefront of the pandemic? Was it really those people that we were hearing from? So there was a lot of really good work coming out of Scotland. Um, but I would also say maybe sometimes uh, the media wasn't helping with um, actually um, making sure that, that uh, the, the restrictions that were made in Scotland were not necessarily the restrictions that were happening in England or Wales, or Northern Ireland. And it was important to be very, um, very clear about what restrictions applied where. And I think that's where the responsibility of the media sometimes um, let, let the tone down there. So that's interesting. We'll, we'll come back to the media and also social media and kind of the, the roles, um, positive or negative, that, that that can have. But John, can I, can I ask you about the situation in Ghana? Because uh, I'll be honest, in, in the UK, that's, uh, we've not heard much about Ghana and the response to COVID. But how has it worked out there? How has uh, the, the general population found the communication? Uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, good morning or good evening to our colleagues, wherever they may be. I guess the, the situation was pretty much similar to what has been reported on from New Zealand and lately from uh, Scotland. We had a very effective communication strategy from the presidency. Uh, actually, the president took the lead in communicating what had to be done. Uh, and it was very much received and it was actually christened fellow Ghanaians because whenever the president came on television, he said fellow Ghanaians. So uh, everybody said fellow Ghanaians. I mean, it became a very uh, ra good rallying point. The president initially had uh, a weekly update <clears throat> Uh, where he basically laid down the, the main strategy that the entire country needed to follow. And then we had the Director General of the Health Services and the Minister of Education during the week also having regular briefings. And then also we had uh, a website that was dedicated to the uh, to the, the numbers of COVID. So how many people have contracted COVID in the last 24 hours, who has died, how many have recovered. So there was very effective communication and information sharing, which I believe was very much appreciated by uh, the entire country, but probably also very similar to what happened in, in, um, in Scotland. Along the line, uh, people began a little, I mean, to became a little, uh, uncomfortable with the way uh, some of the leaders were not showing example. So we can speak about that uh, later on. But generally, the communication was seen to be very, very effective. In fact, many of the, the quotes of the president uh, has been touted all over the place. I mean, <clears throat> he he's uh, very well known to have said, we know how to revive the economy, but we do not how to, we do not know how to bring back people to life. And it, it basically struck a chord with people that hey, this is something serious, uh, and we need to listen to the president. So I think that went quite well uh, initially. Thank you, John. And um, Kai, I'm I'm interested. You've you've had the benefit of hearing uh, what happened there in uh, New Zealand, Scotland, and Ghana. Anything different, particularly I'm thinking about that happened in Malaysia, and I wonder if you've any view about 
you know, the communication generally in countries has not been particularly nuanced. So, I mean, the, the population is very diverse. There, there are people, um, you know, in, in most societies who are at, at the, the extremes, if you like, who did, did not necessarily feel that they were able to comply with a lot of um, the, the government requests and so on, and that they suffered particularly badly. Um, how did that play out in Malaysia? Um, thanks, thanks for having me and thanks for that question. Um, and I think um, if I tie this back to answer your first question as well, um, I think what, what we've heard so far is really exemplary uh, government communications. Um, and while there was some of that in the beginning of the pandemic in Malaysia, I'm going to say that actually the stars um, in terms of highlighting what has gone well in communication in Malaysia is really about the people coming together um, and using social media as a platform. Um, about 86% of the Malaysian population are active on social media. And I think that's where um, we were able to actually gal galvanize some support in the beginning of the first pandemic as well. Um, there was a tagline that was very um, popular that came actually from a group of volunteers who realized you know, how much the the pandemic and the restrictions were affecting the most vulnerable communities, but also more specifically the frontliners, you know, the healthcare workers, the essential workers. So the tagline was um, kita jaga kita, which means we take care of each other, or it could also be seen as we take care of ourselves. And at that time, it was already signaling a little bit of this, like, we don't know how much we can trust the government to take care of us so we're going to take care of each other and you know um there, that actually became a very important solidarity battle cry uh for civil society um but what i notice now in the second wave or this this subsequent wave where the situation has actually gotten even more dire um the the narrative in the communication in civil society is now about um, supporting people who've lost their incomes, who've lost their livelihoods um, because of this prolonged restriction. Um, I think we've been, I mean, Malaysia has been in some form of lockdown since March um, or maybe earlier. So um, there's a, a, another campaign called the white flag campaign, and it's both a physical and a digital white flag where people can raise a white flag to signal that they need help. Um, and people around them who are aware of that can send essentials and, and um, give the support that they need. Um, so I feel like that's one thing that we've done well in trying to um, respond to the changing needs of the pandemic uh, in terms of the community. But the other thing I think um, that um, is really interesting is how, because everybody's uh, quite active on social media, with the vaccination um, hesitance that we had in the beginning, they actually, when, whenever the um, vaccination um, centers prop, popped up, they also had like Instagram frames for people to take pictures and they asked people to please post up on social media that you've gotten vaccinated. Um, and so that's kind of shifted the um, question from the public from um, is the vaccine safe to when can I get it? Um, but also because you know, COVID's gotten a lot worse in Malaysia. But I think that's where um, we've we've done the communication in a very communal way, um, and using social media. Okay, that that that's interesting. And actually, I, I want to pick up on that point, but almost by asking Courtney and Ruth to to think about this uh, from a New Zealand Scotland perspective. And it, it's um, Kai, you you were talking there almost about. Um, the government trusting citizens to do things as well as citizens trusting the government you know so uh, some governments uh, i i think in dealing with covid have felt unable to trust citizens and need to just dictate to citizens what they have to do and be in control of everything whereas some governments have said do you know what um, you citizens can do things very well we'll give you the the tools if you like um, and the advice, and then we would like you to react and be creative around that. But I'm, I'm just thinking with that as a background, um, I was struck this morning, Courtney, on one of our, our morning radio programs, there was an interview from, and my apologies, I, for, I forget his name, but he was a leader of the opposition in New Zealand. 
and he was being asked about Jacinda Ardern, his political opposite, if you like, how she had been dealing with it. And the interviewer at some point said, you seem very reluctant to criticize. Well, if I then look at you, Ruth, and say, well, in Scotland, they wouldn't be the, the, the political opponents of our first minister would not be reluctant to criticize. And in fact, um, I, I, I don't know how you can look at the impact of this, but it seems to me that in New Zealand, there's been a very enabling political environment, whereas perhaps in the UK, and I don't know about Ghana and Malaysia, it's not a particularly enabling environment because people can't set politics aside. Uh, so have to feel they have to criticize. Um, I mean, Ruth, am I being uh, unfair about the environment in Scotland? It's just, that's how it seemed to me. You're absolutely right. And I think especially the UK approach to how they were talking to the public, as I said, it was a sort of a paternal approach, but it was also, there was a blame attributed to some groups and there was also a sort of a speaking down to the public as well. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there is a relative um, amount that the government has to trust in the people, but you also have to support the people to trust in what they're being asked to do. And I think um, where we've seen co-produced solutions, and here I would have used the example of um, maybe New Zealand and uh, Taiwan, where they've, um, they've asked um, the public to get involved, people are much more likely to abide by restrictions that they themselves have had some sort of input into. But they trust it, they understand the process, and even if they don't agree with it, they've seen why this decision has been made. And I think that's where we have to be really careful in the UK, is that we're sort of... Um, we're acting in some way like the public are children and they can't be trusted with the real scientific evidence and where the evidence is actually changing quite frequently we have to trust that the public can keep up with that and can understand it but sometimes with the UK government it wasn't very helpful the way they were explaining what was happening I think we all had a bit of a laugh at some of the graphs and the images that they were showing that were really unhelpful and even, even as academics we were struggling to kind of work through them so I think um, the other examples I would use, um, which I think were mentioned in the slides about um, Canada's Let's Talk Science in schools and in Finland, they've also um, gone to great effort to tackle fake news and misinformation. These are the things that we're not tackling properly in the UK, about how conspiracy theories get, get a hold of the public and how um, they spread in social media as well. And I think we have to be really careful about how we are supporting citizens to be critical um, and to be um, actively involved in better understanding the science. Yeah, thank you. And, and actually, and now I want to, I'll just remind everybody, if you have any questions, please put them in the, the Q&A box. But there's, there's one question there, which we might, that it naturally follows on from this. Uh, and it's from, it, it's an anonymous question, but the, the question is this, is to what extent do the panel feel that government should monitor and if necessarily control media communications about COVID-19. So, I mean, that, that's kind of, that's a kind of a big question. So, because many of us might immediately feel uncomfortable about government controlling the media. It can't control social media, but I, I guess it has influence around uh, central media. Um, um, I mean, Kai, can I ask you about that? Because you've talked about the preponderance of social media in Malaysia, but should governments, um, control, I put that kind of invented in, in, in inverted comments, the communication on something that's so crucial, such as a pandemic? Thanks for that very tricky question. <laughs> um, I think that there's like different kinds of misinformation, but there's also different um, actors and proponents of, of misinformation. And I think in looking at what to do about it, we, we have to also look at the intent I think if there was like solid evidence that there are groups putting out misinformation with the purpose to misinform um, for whatever um, devious reasons, then I think it would be it would be good if we actually did have some legal recourse to deal with that. But the problem is a lot of the misinformation is so amorphous. A lot of it is also mixed with misunderstanding um, or just repeating things that they've heard. Um, and it's in that case, I don't think a legal action or control is going to solve the problem. Um, and I think one of the things that I realize um, just 
thinking back in what's come through um, my WhatsApp <laughs> the past uh, two years about COVID is just how much it's exposed um, that we have a very suboptimal understanding of basic health and science among educated adults, not even, you know, people who um, I, like children or people I don't expect to, to know these things, but I'll give you an example. Like I, there was a circular debate about whether ivermectin can replace vaccines. And, and you know, ivermectin is a deworming medicine and a, and a vaccine is not a medicine. And, and I would have thought two years ago, and this was like, a, I mean, most, um, People would would know this at a, you know at some point, um, but it was it was surprising that a lot of people actually don't. And so I think when when there are some basic um, lack of science literacy or or health literacy um, available, we can't blame people if they become easily swayed by misinformation. And so that's what I think needs to be more um, actively addressed. Yeah, and of course, I, I really support that. I mean, science literacy, partly because almost every aspect of our life, you know, from the minute we get up in the morning to go to bed at night, it, it our life depends on science, engineering and technology. And people should, you know, have the benefit of knowing about that and, and also questioning it, I guess. I mean, John, I'm thinking from the point of view in, in Ghana, um, how did the media... Uh, work with government or not with in terms of communicating the messages that the government wish to get across to the population? Well, thank you very much again. I mean, Ghana has a very uh, plural media, uh, very, very vibrant. And the, the initial uh, engagement was, in my opinion, very positive. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, briefing of the the main media houses was done very regularly, and uh, it was carried by various networks. So th there was very very positive engagement. Um, however, along the line, um, there were a few challenges here and there. And uh, I think, again, it boils down, in my opinion, to scientific communication. There was uh, the suggestion by certain sections of the media that uh, government was holding back on the real numbers. And, uh, and therefore, people became a little skeptical along the lines. Uh, as to whether the numbers that were being churned out were, were reliable. And uh, we had uh, some media people becoming epidemiologists overnight and uh, <laughs> churning out, I mean, data which in my opinion was uh, very questionable. So it's a whole issue of building of trust, mm -hmm. but Along the line also came the challenge of social media. And uh, unfortunately, most of the things that I saw on social media were, were rather negative. Uh, the whole conspiracy theory of uh, some pathogen uh, escaping from a laboratory, and it was an attempt by the Western countries to wipe out populations in Africa. And uh, so it, it made people begin to question the data that was coming out and the regular briefings that were coming from the hierarchy. So the question was, should we believe what uh, is being churned out on social media or not? And I mean, honestly, Ghana has become so vibrant as far as the plural media is concerned, such that sometimes you see certain things on social media and you would, I mean, you, you feel like just believing that that is the truth. So deciphering the, the difference between the real information and the truth became a problem along the line. And as you said, we need an, an educated media to be able to, uh, uh, be able to give the, the, the population the right kind of information. We had a challenge there, definitely. 
uh, in as much as they were, they were willing to support and provide the necessary impetus for things to be done. There was a challenge along those lines. And then the politics also came in. And I'm sure you know, globally, there are some media houses which are politically aligned. And when that comes in, uh, it, it basically makes the whole environment very murky. And for us in Ghana, the year 2020 was an election year. So uh, you have a president who has banned all social gatherings and uh, nobody was allowed to have political rallies if you know the way campaigning is done in our part of the world. Nobody could do political rallies anywhere. But you have a president who was rerunning for election on television every week, reaching out to the people. So all those things made the environment very, very, uh, maybe poisoned to some extent. But I think by and large, we, we came through and uh, uh, I guess Ghana was the winner. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that's interesting. And actually there were some parallels there, I think with Scotland, because we had elections as well, whilst our first minister was appearing every day on the media and our campaigning is done slightly differently, but it, an interesting point. Can I, can I ask, and Courtney, I'm gonna to come to you on this. Um, Derek Young has asked a question and um, what he's saying is that, um, would the science community help political leaders um, to engage, I suppose, better with, with the public, uh, to, to, I suppose, give political leaders the confidence that the public should have a role and that leaders don't have all the answers to complex questions. Um, so, and, and maybe, um, and Derek, I'm, I'm, apologies if, if I'm getting this wrong, but in a way, science communication, you have to think carefully about it because you're often communicating quite complex and, and specialist information, but trying to make that available and, and valuable for a non-specialist audience. So do science communicators have a, a, a role there? What do you think about that, Courtney? Oh, absolutely. And I think this was one of the great challenges of the pandemic um, and continues to be is the fact that, you know, we there's just so much that we didn't know and decisions were of necessity being made based on information that was imperfect, that was partial, that was changing week by week or day by day even. Um, one of the things that our leaders in New Zealand did was they were particularly transparent about what they didn't know um, and they would for example, um, part of those daily briefings that I mentioned earlier involved a back and forth between our press gallery journalists and the Prime Minister and Director General of Health. When they didn't have answers to something, they would say it very plainly, and then they would come back with the best information that they had once it was available to them. Um, and they were very open about the fact that this was, there were a lot of unknowns, that they just, they were making the best decisions they could with the information available to them. Um, and the work that we've done subsequently um, interviewing people shows that people were actually really sympathetic to that. And it actually becomes a project in explaining to people and building understanding of the way that science works fun fundamentally, right? Because science is a motor of uncertainty at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it feeds on this. Um, and the more that people understand that, I think the more nuanced conversations we can have about the way that knowledge is built and evolved and revised. And, you know, sometimes we backtrack and sometimes we move forward and, um, you know, there was an opportunity here to actually develop a much richer conversation around science. And as for science communicators, absolutely, they they played a big role in that as well. Thanks, Courtney. Um, we're, we're sort of coming to, to nearing the end of, of our, our one hour uh, event time. And I'm just looking at the, the, the questions that are uh, in front of me, and they're quite interesting because there's a common theme. I mean, there's a lot about trust and, um, Actually, Kai, I you know have a look at the questions. There's one particularly about um, people in Malaysia thinking that the government aren't telling the truth about COVID figures. So, well, John, you also mentioned that, and um, you know people start bickering about the figures when they're maybe trying to make a point. But um, and I, I don't know whether you want to type an answer to that one. Uh, it, if you've got some particular comments that you'd like to make. But the other two questions that I'm looking at at the moment. 
um, one from Fraser and another anonymous one. But they're both asking similar questions, which is, you know, how can governments react and communicate effectively scientific information to the public when there's uncertainty about the science? And, you know, science in some way has been quite magnificent du during the pandemic from and it's not been from a standing start because we had so much knowledge about uh, viruses and vaccines and and so on. Um, John, it's your area around in infectious epidemiology, but we we had a lot of information, but really very quickly, you know, started sequencing the viruses, looking at spread, looking at um, infectivity, and what you know, why is the Delta variant more infectious now? We think we know why. What mutations have been. Uh, have been happening and how we might deal with those. Um, how, how do we communicate uncertainty? Because um, uh, someone, I, I think it was you, Fraser, said, um, Churchill said, experts should be on tap, but not on top. He also said that what he wanted most was a one-handed chief scientific advisor. And the reason was because if you ask a scientist something, they always say, well, on the one hand, and they won't give you a straight answer because of uncertainty, which most scientists are completely happy with. We, I love uncertainty. It's, ex, it's exciting uh, and a challenge. Whereas I think the public don't, they don't need uncertainty. Just tell me what to do. So. Can I ask, I mean, who would, who would like to address that? Um, yeah, hands up, I, anyone? I John? I, so I, I can have a go at this. I, I think we need to be humble enough to say we do not know when we do not know. This was, and it's still an evolving uh, pandemic, um, which we're all trying to understand. Um, We've had various variants, as you alluded to, which have had uh, different levels of virulence. And uh, the truth of the matter is that we are still learning by the day. And uh, politicians don't want to hear that. If I'm advising a politician and I tell him that I do not know, he feels uncomfortable because they think that they must know it all and go and be in front of the cameras and tell the country that they know it all. But unfortunately we do not. And I think we should be humble enough to know that. That, that, that is all I would want to say there. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. And you know, having been in those advisory roles, um, I know that politicians get, I, I can remember one politician saying to me, for goodness sake, can you just tell me one thing that's absolutely true and certain about science? Um, you know, and at the time I said, nothing travels faster than the speed of light. And unfortunately, <laughs> the next day I, I woke up to hear that scientists from the Gran Sasso Laboratory in Italy had just determined that there was a particle traveling faster than the speed of light. It turned out to be not true, but I, it just reminded me that, you know, there's no such thing as absolute truth in a way in science but okay I'm, I'm going to pull this uh together we could have discussed for very much longer um I just uh, Courtney Ruth Kai John um one in in one sentence do you think we've learned from the pandemic and communication will be better in the future on issues like this Courtney what do you think I don't know. <laughs> um, I think I think this highlights the fact that our communication, you know, the best communication in the world isn't going to cover up decision making that people won't stand behind. Um, that's my sort of take home message from the last 18 months. <laughs> okay, slightly depressing. But uh, Kai, what do you think? I mean, um, I think in terms of community, yeah, it's hard to predict what would happen if we ever go come across another COVID-19. But my question right now is, are we ever going to get out of COVID-19? I mean, that's my first depressing question. But um, what I noticed um, being in Australia right now is that 
communication has the best chance of being effective if it's also tied to a concrete action that people can take. So it's not just about risk communication, but what can you do about this risk? So I think the best example here is like, we have snap lockdowns that become more snappier over time here, um, but it's always like, whenever there's like a, a list of exposure sites, immediately people know they, there are places where they can go to get tested. Um, and the testing is massively, uh, widely available and free. And that's when that communication of the expo potential exposure and the risk and where we're at in the pandemic can then be empowering for people to go, yeah, okay, I'm gonna go get tested because I visited so-and-so site. And I think that's when it can actually be effective. Um, and if that's something that we learn from this is that it, I mean, we talked about uncertainty just now, sorry, this is a long sentence, but I think a lot of things that people predicted were actually did happen. Like if you do nothing or if you do little, if you don't act early enough, this is what you get. Um, it's a bit sobering, but um, if, if anything, that, that science was correct on that one. Um, so in the future, hopefully we do take this more seriously and act early. Thank you. Um, Ruth, your thoughts, will it be better? I don't think it matters how clear communication and public health messaging is. If you don't have a more equitable society, people can't abide by the restrictions. And I think moving forward, especially in Scotland, that's what we need to think about. It's a human rights approach to social support, social progress, and making sure that everybody feels that they have a stake in their own future. And then they will be able to abide by restrictions much more easily or um, keep up with public communication. Thanks for that. Uh, and John, final word for you. Yeah, I, I think we are still on a learning curve. And uh, for me, one clear issue is that those of us in developing countries should learn to invest a lot more in R&D uh, in whatever area it is. I mean, look at the problems with access to vaccines. We didn't even get opportunity to discuss that at all. I mean, in Africa, less than 2% of the population has been vaccinated. So it, it tells you that there is a problem. Uh, so we have a very long learning curve and uh, we need to put our money where our mouth is. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, John. Um, can I thank you, Courtney, Ruth, John and Kai very much for your contributions. Um, also, um, Alexa and Talat for giving us the introduction to this event. Of course, our colleagues at the RSE who've organized the event and uh, put this together. Um, and just, just in, in leaving, I think if I could summarize some of our discussion, we talked about trust being very important because um, you can communicate all you like, but if people don't trust you, then there, it's uh, almost just going into a void. That's a very important issue that Ruth brought up about uh, equity. There are some, some fundamental platforms in society we need to be resilient as a society and uh, a more equitable society is surely one of those. And empowering the population to do things. I, I think empowerment uh, of, of a population to feel that they can do things and that they are working together is, is crucial. And uh, it came out as well, I wasn't expecting this necessarily, but that you know, perhaps our politicians should rethink their purpose and role. They're, they're there to represent us, the, the citizens of any country. They're not there to control us, they're there to represent us. And so in fact, almost giving up some of that control and sharing it with uh, the citizens more effectively might be uh, more constructive in the end. We've overrun a little, I, I do apologize for that, but I would um, particularly uh, like to thank those of you who've joined us this morning. I hope you've uh, benefited and been excited by the discussion as I have. Um, and uh, have a look at the RSE website and join in some more of events, they're, they're for you. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day or the small amount that remains of your evening, depending where you are in the world. Okay, goodbye. Yeah, goodbye, thanks Thank for you. having us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.